August 1920, and a young woman decides to go on holiday on the south coast of England, which would be a welcome break from both her office job and her parents. This proves to be an ill-fated decision, and leads to a shingle beach and a horrific murder. Irene Monroe was a 17-year-old typist working for a firm of chartered accountants in Oxford Street in London. She told her mother, Flora, of her plan to holiday by herself in the seaside resort of Eastbourne on the south coast of Sussex, rather than visit relatives as her family had done previously during the holiday period for a number of years. Her mother agreed to these plans and assisted in the arrangements for her only daughter to spend two weeks in Eastbourne before returning to the family home in South Kensington while she travelled to visit the family in Scotland on the 14th of August. Two days later, Irene set off for the south coast and on arrival soon found the small hotel where she was to stay at 393 Seaside and is known to have written a letter to her mother that evening informing her of her safe arrival in Eastbourne. By pre-arrangement, Munro paid the establishment's owner, Mrs Ada Winniat, the weekly cost of her room of 30 shillings in advance. Mrs Winniat later said she quickly got on well with the young Londoner, who still had a slight Scottish accent. Subsequent to her arrival, Munro is known to have written a second letter to her mother, as she relaxed on Eastbourne Beach, again informing her of her safe arrival and detailing her having visited local landmarks such as Beachy Head the previous day. She closed this letter by writing, Goodbye for the present. Please give my love to Granny, Auntie, Jessie and everyone. Yours affectionately, Reen. Although Mrs Winniat stated Munro had been fairly cheerful, during the initial days of her holiday. She later testified that, by the 18th of August, two days after her arrival at the holiday destination, Irene seemed to have come somewhat downcast, telling her, My mother wanted me to go to Scotland with her. I should have gone. I wish I had gone now. Three days into her holiday, Irene encountered two local men, Jack Field aged 19, and William Gray, aged 29. The two struck up some kind of friendship with her, offering to show us some local landmarks before the trio had a drink in a local pub. Irene then returned to her hotel for lunch, having agreed to meet the two men at a bus stop located opposite the Archery Tavern, close to the village of Pevensey that afternoon. Before leaving her hotel shortly before three o'clock, Irene told Mrs Winniat of her intention to visit a nearby park, with the plan of doing some boating on the lake there. According to subsequent eyewitness accounts, Irene was already waiting at the bus stop when both men arrived by bus to meet her. One of the last people to see her alive noticed her talking amicably with the two, as they walked in the direction of the Crumbles Beach. According to this eyewitness, the younger of the two men was walking arm in arm with Munro at around four in the afternoon. The park visit never happened. Instead, the three had reached a secluded section of the Crumbles Beach, approximately 300 yards from the closest inhabited property, and within sight of Pemmersey Castle. Irene said she needed to rest for a few minutes after the long walk. It was a hot day, before reaching into her silk handbag for a handkerchief, which she used to dab her face. As she did so, the two men looked at each other, and Gray nodded to his companion. Field then raised the walking stick in his possession, and poised the weapon at shoulder height, as Gray attempted to snatch Munro's handbag. Although startled, 
the girl maintained her grip on her bag, shouting, Hey, what do you think? In response, Field struck Monroe across her mouth with the head of his walking stick, dislodging two of her teeth, loosening two others, and causing her to fall backwards and scream in pain, as Gray shouted, Shut up! Field then called to his friend, For God's sake, do something! In response to both the victim's screams and Field's panicked exclamation, Gray grabbed a nearby rock located close to where she had fallen. She was then brutally battered on the face and head, sustaining shovel fractures to her skull and causing her to die almost instantly. Gray then concealed the girl's handbag beneath his coat before removing a nine-carat gold ring from one of her fingers. Both men then hastily buried her body on the beach in a makeshift shallow grave, first covering her body with her coat and placing her hat over her face. Such was their haste in covering up the crime, they failed to notice one of her feet remained exposed above ground. Within hours of the murder, both men are known to have visited the Albemarle Hotel, where they insisted the two barmaids share a drink of their choice with them, also buying drinks for several local women, with the money from Irene's purse. Later that afternoon, the two men visited the Eastbourne Hippodrome, where Field paid two local men money he had borrowed from them several weeks earlier. Mid-afternoon the following day, Irene Munro's body was discovered by a 13-year-old boy named William Weller, who almost tripped over her exposed foot while running across the beach. Her body was buried in a bank alongside a light railway, typically used for the transport of gravel, which was some 700 yards from the sea. The police were summoned to the gruesome find, with officers from both Hailsham and Eastbourne arriving at the scene. A large bloodstained rock was found two yards from her body, and two rusty shovels were also recovered at the crime scene. The makeshift grave was very shallow, with the shingle covering her body measuring between three and six inches in depth. The area of the Crumbles Beach where Irene's body was discovered was promptly cordoned off and an experienced investigator from Scotland Yard named George Mercer was dispatched to Eastbourne to supervise the investigation. After a forensic examination of the crime scene, late on the evening of the 20th, the body was moved to the mortuary at Eastbourne Town Hall. She was informally identified by Mrs Winniat from the hotel and officially identified by her aunt a couple of days later. The following morning, Jack Field read of the discovery of Irene's body in a local newspaper and both him and Gray are known to have visited a military camp near Eastbourne, hoping to re-enlist in the army in order to evade detection. An autopsy revealed Munro had been dead for approximately 24 hours before her body was discovered. She had been attacked with such savagery that both her upper and lower jaw had been fractured and several teeth had been dislodged or loosened. She had been extensively bludgeoned about the head with a fracture wound on her left cheek extending to her left temple. The first severe blow to the left side of her head had rendered her unconscious, with her death resulting from injury to the brain. Having discovered the identity of the body and learned from Mrs Winniat of Irene's intention to visit the park, investigators visited numerous local cinemas, lodgings and private hotels in their inquiries. When they questioned the barmaids of the Albemarle Hotel, they revealed that the two local men had been regular patrons to the bar in the weeks prior to the murder, although neither seemed to spend too much. According to the barmaids, 
Both men had been broke when they had visited just hours prior to the woman's murder on that fateful day. When they returned to the bar that evening, both men had been flush with money. Both drank expensive bottled beers and purchased drinks for the barmaids and acquaintances as they smoked Turkish cigarettes. Police inquiries soon established that Irene had been seen by numerous people talking with two men in the early afternoon of the 19th, together with their descriptions. The man walking arm in arm with her had been carrying a stick with a metal ferrule shaped like a dog's head at one end. Another witness, Frederick Wells, had also seen Irene walking in the direction of the Crumbles Beach in the company of these men, adding this individual often carried a stick with a bulldog's head upon its handle. Wells added that he had last seen the trio climb beneath a fence some 50 yards from the railway line, crossing the shingle. He accompanied police around Eastbourne, where he soon saw the two men talking to three young women. Wells indicated to police these were the two men he had seen in the victim's company five days earlier. Police arrested both Field and Gray on suspicion of murder on the afternoon of the 24th of August, and they were taken to Eastbourne's Latimer Road Police Station. Both men provided detailed statements regarding their movements in the early afternoon of the day concerned, in which each claimed to have been in the company of the other at the Arbor Mile before returning to Gray's home, where they had eaten a meal prepared by Gray's wife, before spending the remainder of the day at the Hippodrome. Both were initially released from custody, pending further inquiries, after two days of questioning. Investigators had obtained many accounts from people disproving the statements made by both men, as several witnesses recollected having seen the two leaving the Arbor Mile and boarding a bus, travelling in the direction of Archery Tavern. Police spoke with the bus conductor, George Blackmer, who informed investigators he knew both men well, and confirmed the two had indeed alighted from his bus outside the Archery Tavern. Although contrary to their witness statements, the two had not simply walked along Pemsey Road, but that a teenage girl with dark hair, wearing a black straw hat and carrying a green coat over her arm, had walked from the bus shelter to greet them. When shown a photograph of Irene, Blackmer positively identified her as the girl who had approached Field and Grey outside the archery tavern. No one could be found to corroborate the accounts both men gave to the police regarding their movements on the day in question, with investigators also discovering Field and Grey had attempted to persuade a local girl to claim she had been in their company at the time of the murder. Multiple eyewitness accounts placed the two men in the company of Irene, walking in the direction of the Crumbles, where her body was discovered the following day. Two of the witnesses also stated Field had been carrying a distinctive walking stick with a ferrule shaped like a dog's head at one end. A search of his home recovered this item and distinctive articles of clothing described by eyewitnesses as being worn by the men on the day were recovered at the homes of both men. In light of these developments, they were re-arrested and charged with Munro's murder on the evening of the 4th of September. The official inquest into Irene Munro's death resumed in early September, having been previously adjourned while the police continued their inquiries. At this hearing, the jury returned verdicts of willful murder against both defendants, and they were held on remand at Maidstone Prison. The trial of Field and Gray for the murder of Irene Munro began at Lewes Assizes on the 13th of December 1920. Both men were tried before Mr Justice Avery, and both pleaded not guilty to the charge. The prosecution outlined the lives of both men, 
describing the two as unemployed ex-servicemen and close companions, with a history of petty theft and robbery, before describing how Irene had travelled to Eastbourne for a fortnight's holiday and her encounter with the defendants three days later. Referring to the afternoon of the murder, the statements both men had given to the police on the date of their initial arrest almost identically tallied as to their whereabouts at the time, although numerous independent witnesses would testify they had seen the two men in the company of the victim, walking in the direction of and along the Crumbles Beach, proving their statements were deliberately inaccurate. Referring to the afternoon of the murder, the statements both men had given to the police on the date of their initial arrest almost identically tallied as to their whereabouts at the time, although numerous independent witnesses would testify they had seen the two men in the company of the victim, walking in the direction of and along the Crumbles Beach, proving their statements were deliberately inaccurate. The two Albemarle Hotel barmaids testified as to the moments of the defendants on the date of the murder, adding that the second time the two men had been in the bar, both had been spending extravagantly and smoking expensive cigarettes. The testimony of these barmaids was followed by numerous eyewitnesses who testified as to seeing two men in the company of Irene, either or both of whom each witness was able to positively identify. A local girl named Hilda Baxter told of the efforts of both defendants, who she had not known previously, to persuade her to construct a false alibi, adding there was no truth in the claims of both men being with her in Pevency on the afternoon of the murder. Baxter's testimony was corroborated by two other women, who each testified Baxter had not left their employer's property on the afternoon in question. Neither Field nor Gray seemed particularly interested in the legal proceedings, and although Gray chose not to testify in his own defence on the advice of his counsel, Field took the stand, responding to questioning, and recounted his movements. He admitted to having little money on the dates in question, although he denied having ever met Irene Munro, or having been on the Crumbles Beach that week. He confirmed that he and Gray had indeed got off a bus outside the Archery Tavern on the afternoon of the 19th of August. Both, he claimed, had visited a nearby circus, arriving at approximately 2.45pm. Field insisted that all the money he had spent on these dates had been from the weekly unemployment benefit payment of 29 shillings that he had received on the morning of the murder. Field admitted he and Gray had attempted to re-enlist in the army, but claimed the reason had been that Gray's pension had recently been reduced, and that he also knew his unemployment benefit would not continue indefinitely. When questioned as to earlier witness testimony, placing both men in the company of the victim on the afternoon of the 19th, and walking to the location where her body was discovered the following day, Field insisted this testimony was inaccurate. He also stated the reason he and Gray had attempted to persuade Hilda Baxter to provide them with an alibi prior to their arrest had been because the two had seen no one who they knew in Pevency in the afternoon, and the two had therefore feared their alibi would not be believed. On the 17th of December... Both counsels delivered their closing arguments to the jury and outlined the numerous witnesses who testified as to having seen the two defendants with Irene Munro shortly before the time several medical experts had testified she had been murdered and the defendants' subsequent efforts to concoct a false alibi as to their whereabouts at this time. Addressing the jury on behalf of Field, his counsel stated the prosecution's case on behalf of his client rested entirely upon circumstantial evidence. Inaccuracies some witnesses had provided to investigators when describing the clothing of either the victim or men seen in her company before inferring the murder must have been committed at or after dusk 
as opposed to in broad daylight. Referring to the earlier testimony of Dr. Cadman, a pathologist, it was stated that if the jury accepted his testimony that the victim could not have been murdered prior to 11pm on the 19th of August, it would be an end to the case for the prosecution. Outlining Irene's character, it was suggested that it would have been unlikely that a lady like an educated young woman would have thought the acquaintance of two unemployed, unambitious and heavy drinking individuals like the defendants. Referring to the prosecution contention that the motive for the murder was robbery and the testimony from Dorothy Ducker that his client had promised her he and Field would have more money by late afternoon, it was suggested that the victim was not worth robbing and that no evidence existed to show premeditation. The trial lasted a total of five days. In his final address to the jury on the 17th of December, Judge Avery informed the jury both men were jointly charged with Irene Munro's murder, with one defendant aiding and abetting the other, adding that it was immaterial which defendant actually murdered the girl. The judge also instructed the jury not to allow their decision to be influenced by any material pertaining to the murder they had read, and only to bring in a verdict of guilty if satisfied beyond all reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt. The jury then retired to consider their verdict, and just over an hour later found both men guilty of Irene Munro's murder. Although due to their belief no evidence of premeditation existed, the jury did recommend mercy for both defendants. In formally passing the death sentence against both men, Mr. Justice Avery solemnly stated, Jack Alfred Field and William Thomas Gray, you have been found guilty of a foul and brutal murder, and the defence you have both concocted has been demonstrated to be untrue. My duty is now to pass upon you the sentence of the law. That sentence is that you be taken hence to a lawful prison, and thence to a place of execution, and that you be there hanged by the neck until you are dead and that your bodies be afterwards buried within the precincts of the prison, wherein you shall have last been confined before your execution. And I direct that this sentence shall be carried out at Wormus Prison, and may the Lord have mercy upon your souls. The motive for Munro's murder was clearly robbery, but not necessarily murder. Both men had been unemployed for extended periods of time, following their discharge from the armed forces. Neither held any inclination to actually work for a living, and shortly after the two had become acquainted in June 1920, they had developed a habit of committing opportunist petty theft, and, in a fortnight prior to murdering Irene, of befriending and robbing tourists. Field had struck Monroe across the face when she had refused to release her handbag containing approximately £2.10 shillings, after Gray attempted to steal the bag from her, after the two had lured the girl to a secluded location. Gray had been the individual to fatally bludgeon Munro, although Field had initiated the actual physical assault by hitting the victim across the mouth with his walking stick. Both men filed appeals against their convictions, which were heard in mid-January each blamed the other for the woman's murder at the hearing. According to Field, he and Gray had first seen Irene walking along the seafront on the 17th of August and had become acquainted with her the following day. Field's appeal also contended that the two had been with her on the afternoon of the murder, although he had left her alone with Gray on the beach and that later in the afternoon of the murder he had walked towards Pevensey Bay where he encountered Gray, who informed him the two had a quarrel, and Munro had gone home. He claimed not to know Gray's true intentions towards Munro. Gray denied these accusations, and his appeal alleged he had parted company with Field at the Albemarle Hotel at approximately 2.30 in the afternoon, before returning alone to his home. According to Gray, he did not see Field again until later in the evening. 
Gray further alleged Field had later confessed to him that he had walked with Irene to the beach where he had said something which displeased her and she slapped him across the face. He had then hit the girl, rendering her unconscious and, fearing Monroe would report him to the police, had then struck her on the head with a rock which had killed her before he buried her on the beach. The Lord Chief Justice rejected these appeals on the 18th of January, describing the renewed accounts of events by both men as desperate last-ditch fabrications concocted to escape the consequences of their crime by placing blame upon the other. Both men were executed at Wandsworth Prison at 8am on the 4th of February 1921. Two reporters were permitted to witness the executions, and approximately 200 members of the public awaited official notification outside the prison. Contemporary reports indicate both men walked stoically and unassisted to the scaffold. Neither man confessed to Irene Munro's murder before their deaths. (laughs) 